The Malama Honua Worldwide Voyage of Hokulea drew worldwide attention to the message urging everyone to care for each other, our oceans, and Earth. What will be the next journey for Nainoa Thompson and the Polynesian Voyaging Society? Will the spirit and the energy behind their amazing accomplishment take on a new mission, but this time on shore? This live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Lari Yamada. This past June, thousands welcomed the Hokulea returning after a three-year worldwide voyage. Sailing by traditional navigation methods using only the stars, ocean currents, and other signs of nature to guide the way, the double-hulled canoe traveled more than 46,000 miles. Ma Lama Honua, or Caring for the Earth, was the mission of this journey, and crew members shared their message with thousands of people at more than 140 ports in 20 countries and territories. Next, the Mahalo Hawaii Sail will be an eight-month voyage with stops at 40 ports and 80 communities throughout the Hawaiian Islands. The work will be land-based, working with schools and organizations to continue the focus started on the Malama Honua voyage to care for the Earth. So joining us tonight is the Hokulea's master navigator and community members who have been deeply involved in carrying out Hokulea's mission. There are also crew members on the Malama Honua voyage and will share their stories about the recent worldwide voyage as well as their hopes for the next journey ahead. So we look forward to your participation as well in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. All right, now to our guest. Nainoa Thompson is the president of the Polynesian Voyaging Society and a master in the traditional Polynesian art of non-instrument navigation. Since 1976, he has played an integral part in the design, construction, sailing, and navigating of the double-hulled voyaging canoe, Hokulea. Nainoa Thompson is the first Hawaiian to practice the art of wayfinding on long-distance voyages since such voyaging ended around the 14th century. David Lasner is Chancellor of the University of Hawaii at Manoa and concurrently serves as the 15th President of the University of Hawaii. He has been on the staff of the university since 1977, Mr. Lasner serving as a crew member during the Washington, D.C. and New York leg of the worldwide voyage. Eric Koh is the Senior Program Officer for Marine Conservation for the Herald K.L. Castle Foundation has over 12 years of professional experience working in the fields of marine science and conservation in Hawaii, the Pacific Islands as well, the Caribbean and Australia. And Miki Tomita is the director of the Polynesian Voyaging Society's Learning Center. She has worked in education for 15 years as a teacher, educator, curriculum developer, and researcher. So thank you so much, all of you, for, for being here today. It's been a couple of months now since uh, the crew came back from such an epic journey. Uh, a lot of time to talk about it, a lot of time also to, to reflect on what this meant um, and how you see it now. So maybe I'll start with you, Nainoa. Uh, your thoughts after, after being back for a couple of months now? On, on what this was all about and, and how you see um, what you did over the past few years? Well, big question. Big um, question. <laughs> yeah. I really don't think it's really about what I saw. It was really about, um, I mean, it's always the same, right? The, um, the, the purpose, the vision, the, the intention of the worldwide voyage really comes from what you were taught. And um, so I always go back to, um, a really powerful time in the mid 70s when the extraordinary pi pioneers Herb Connie and Dr. Ben Finney, math, the only real master navigator, Mao P. I. Lugan, and my father, and, uh, and, and many other teachers that taught us the values about, about standing up for the things you believe in, uh, work towards what's just in the world. And, um, and so Hokulea's voyages have been an evolution and a changing towards that. And, and my great best friend and, uh, and mentor and teacher, Hawaii's second astronaut, Lacey Veach, is really the person that planted the seed about the worldwide voyage in 1992, talking about how beautiful the Blue Island Earth is. And uh, 
especially when you see the whole thing from space as, as, a, as a participant in the shuttle program and, um, and how much it is, it's being changed. You know, we're changing the world, it's gonna change us and, um, and you can't protect what you don't understand and, and you won't if you don't care and, and you can't do it by yourself. So he was the one to take Hokal Air around the world. It was, it, was, it was a coalition of all these values that helped our community come together and, and believe that this is going to be something worth the risk to take. So it's a, it's been a long journey to get here. It's not just the three years of voyaging, and it's not over. I mean, the worldwide voyage essentially doesn't end till next summer, after we pay respect and uh, and aloha and mahalo those that were our beneficiaries, our children of Hawaii, and go back to these communities to thank them because without them, this voyage would have no value. So we're really excited about this last leg of the voyage, which is really the most important, going back to our communities and thanking them and learning from them. Now, Eric, uh, you've been uh, so involved in marines conservation for quite some time now. So each one of you had different levels of, of exposure and experience and time on the Hokulea and obviously affected you in, in so many different ways. Why was this uh, so important to you to be a part of this? And, and was it the kind of experience that you expected, or was it different? I don't think I have the vocabulary to properly describe how profound the experience is. I think for me, it's transformative. And you know, personally, to, to experience the really powerful sense of community and dependence on each other on the canoe uh, was something that really changed the way I view my work. Uh, and you know, when you share a space that's no greater than a thousand square feet with 12, 13, 14 other people, and you work there, you rest there, you cook there, you spend so much time together that those kinds of interactions really need to be met with kindness and respect, support, patience, and really love. And so, you know, when you step out of that space, you think to yourself, well, how, how can we recreate that space? Uh, with our broader community, with, uh, with our resource management community, uh, with all of those that really care for the ocean. And so for us, it was really um, an effort to kind of take Hokule's inspiration and turn it into action and really think about, okay, well, you know, what does it mean to work together and what does it mean to recognize properly that, you know, Hawaii itself is a canoe that binds us together, that, that we're wholly dependent on. Uh, so I think that uh, that's kind of the powerful message that we can carry forward and continue to build on. Now, Mickey, uh, you've been an educator for a long time. <laughs> and so much of what the Hokulea and the crew are doing is educating, I think now more so than ever. And it just keeps expanding. Mm -hmm. You got a chance uh, to be part of the uh, Deep Sea Lake as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that like for you? What, did that change you? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think any time that you can engage with any of the voyaging canoes, it's a life-changing experience to just see the transcendence of time. Like, we're beyond time. We're hundreds of years of heritage and knowledge on the deck of the voyaging canoe, and we're taking it to new places, places that this knowledge is old and new at the same time, uh, places that have lost their voyaging traditions that are looking to Hokulea for hope and for guidance, um, but also as we visit these communities um, across the Pacific and around the world um, to see their stories of hope and the way that they are revitalizing and working towards um, cultural renaissance in their own communities. And I think that um, Hokulea and the Worldwide Voyage is a vehicle for sharing our own stories and for um, accepting and, and asking permission to share stories of others has been part of um, the biggest transformative experience for me as a teacher. It's just the act of listening and sharing. And whenever you accept knowledge, you accept the responsibility to teach more. Um, and I've seen that in all of our crew members, and I've seen that in students that we've met around the world, that they accept that responsibility, and we all become a more caring and learning community. Now, David, you got to be part of the Washington, uh, D.C. leg. What did you expect going into this? So I was. Um I would say an apprentice crew member. Um, <laughs> very grateful for the opportunity. Um, I really didn't know what to expect, and, and I would just echo what um, Eric said. Um, I think Nainoa 
created an environment, and I know he'll take no credit for this, but in which different people came together, um, most of whom didn't know each other at the beginning, and um, came together with purpose. And the purpose, I mean, this is, when you think back and the first time I heard about the, the notion of the worldwide voyage, and I hadn't been part of it, I thought, this is nuts. Who would think to take a traditional Polynesian voyaging canoe around the world? And then the more I got involved in it, it um, um, there's a term in, in some of the literature around uh, leadership and organizational success called a big, hairy, audacious goal, and that's that was the amazing experience that everybody who participated uh, became inspired and particularly at homecoming. It was incredibly inspiring to see everyone. Um, for me, the probably the highlight of the Washington to, to New York voyage was coming into New York Harbor, and I'm not from this part of the world, you could probably tell. Um, my grandparents um, immigrated to the U.S. from Eastern Europe, and they came in through New York Harbor. So for me to come in on Hokulea, into the same harbor, my grandparents came into this country from, um, was a pretty amazing experience. Would you say there's something that you learned or experienced that you didn't expect? Um, I, I think, I, um, you know, the sharing together and the way in which the canoe and the voyage have become an inspiration for everyone in Hawaii. And I felt that most at homecoming um, when we came in, and I was um, so fortunate to have the opportunity to come in on um, Hokulea from Kalaupapa. And um, the feeling from the people who were on shore, on the canoes, on the watercraft, hundreds of them um, on the water, um, all kinds of different people so proud of, of what had been accomplished. You know, Eric, I was taking a look at uh, some of the blogs you had been writing uh, beforehand, and, and then um, then as you as you got into it, and a couple of things I noticed. Uh, one that you wrote early on when you were just kind of starting in this process, uh, you were talking about uh, being at the UN. Uh, uh, it was a small uh, something conference of sorts, and how uh, it was so much about everybody learning each other's language, kind of like, I think you called it speed dating, like speed dating. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, trying to understand and, and make that connection before everybody moved forward. And then one of the later blogs, I noticed um, you expressed how it became intensely emotional for you. Tell me about that, that transformation for you. You know, I, I think, you know, it's a mission. You're given purpose, you're given a role on a canoe, uh, you're serving a specific function, and so you work hard to make sure, uh, you know, for the people around you that you don't drop that ball, that you can execute, you can perform, uh, you can play your, you know, play your part. Uh, and so that, that kind of, that I think is wrapped up in the preparation. And, and then there's the, the kind of, uh, experience itself. And I think nothing can really prepare you for the stark contrast between being out there in the middle of nowhere on the ocean on this canoe that has no power except for the wind. And it becomes really incredibly deeply introspective. And then, you know, you make landfall at all these incredible places and, and you're shown this incredible warmth and generosity and cultural immersion and sharing. And, and so, you know, you quickly have to absorb that. And so there's kind of this very intense interaction with others. Um, and so you can't help but kind of sometimes, I think, feel overwhelmed on both ends of that. Um, and I think for me, something that was a little bit unexpected was uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, we, you know, our stories are ours. But they're also not unique in the sense that uh, it was really surprising to visit a museum in Cuba and learn that shortly after uh, Hokulea's uh, voyage to Tahiti in 1976, I believe in the early 80s, uh, the, the Caribbean people had done their own voyage of rediscovery, built a traditional canoe uh, kind of commensurate with the, the culture that they'd come from, which were a river peoples in South America. And they actually traced their own ancestors' steps 
out of that river system and up the Caribbean archipelago. And so to think, you know, this kind of, these kinds of rediscoveries, this, this kind of existence, these kinds of experiences are actually, they're shared and there's a comfort in that. And I think as a, as a global community on this island earth, as Nainoa likes to put it, uh, and I completely agree, um, I, re I think it does help us understand that, that we, are, we are a community. Speaking of building and working with different communities around the world, I want to start uh, getting into some of the video clips that we have and have you guys talk about that a little bit. The first one that we have um, is out of New York City, and this was called the uh, Billion Oyster Project, mm -hmm. I'm sure you guys are familiar with. Um, so let's take a look at some of that video. You can see it behind you there now. And uh, what was the, the purpose of this? Why was this so important? So Go ahead, Nainoa. I would send it to Mickey. All right, Mickey, you take this. <laughs> um, well, there's a number of reasons why this project was so inspirational. One being that when you talk about indigenous wisdom and ancient technology, the oyster is the original bioremediation <laughs> machine, cleaning water, cleaning ecosystems. Um, but the Hudson River became so polluted that it could not raise oysters. Wow. Um, there was no way to seed the oysters. And so this charter school in New York um, that serves all five boroughs, um, dedicated their entire curriculum to raising a billion oysters, which is what they calculated would clean the Hudson River in four days. Wow. If they were able to get to a billion oysters, they're at 17 million oysters now. Wow. Um, the interesting, for me, one of the most interesting parts of that is that because the Hudson River is too polluted and could not have the oysters be seeded in there, the school, um, as part of their curriculum, is um, focused on aquaculture, so they raise the oysters from um, from seed to to baby, where they can be put in the in the water. They um, they have vessel fabrication and vessel repair as their curriculum, so they can actually boat the oysters out into the river. Um, they do scuba diving as part of their curriculum, so that they can dive and scrub the hulls and 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 monitor um, the oysters as they grow. And then they do outreach with um, about 40 middle schools in the five boroughs to adopt the oyster beds that they grow and to um, embed them in the communities and have the kids engage in citizen science to monitor um, the effect of the oysters in their own estuaries and how that adds to um, the Billion Oyster Project. And, and I wow. think w one of the things that's amazing about this is they started trying to recreate um, a, a past when nature was in much better harmony, mm -hmm. um, when oysters, there were enough oysters to keep cleaning the river and the harbor. And to get there, um, it's amazing science. This is science and engineering mm -hmm. to figure out how to do it. So this is um, like Hokulea and Hikianalia weaving together what can modern science do to help us understand the challenges we face um, and, and um, help create a, a balance in harmony that we have lost. Nainoa, what would you say, um, when did you think, do you feel like you realized the range that the Hokulea had in being a vessel for education? When do you think you felt its range? Um, well, it would de depend on scope, yeah, in Hawaii, I mean, it seems at this point that it's almost endless <laughs> as to the types of projects you, you could be involved in, you could foster. There's, um, your world is your oyster. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I mean. But no, seriously, <clears throat> seriously though, it, it seems. If you take the Billion Oyster Project, right, it was, an edu it was a school with a few students uh, um, amongst a population of 10 million. And yet the, uh, <clears throat> the when I was there, the, the city gave $64 million to the project. The, there's 125 restaurants that are buying the oysters. Um, so, there, so that you have business involved, you have, you have government involved. And there, <clears throat> there was like, my understanding, there was like 150 schools that have ties to mm -hmm. this. And then communities that are looking at the health of their streams are, are starting to grow these oysters. So it was catalytic. So, so when you look at the power of education, it's really the power of the idea. That there was an idea that that and it, and it, and, it, and it was when they did the arithmetic. Let's just get a billion oysters back in this harbor, and we'll clean it in four days. Um, from so you you have what was considered the second most prolific oyster bed in the world, to a place that was so unhealthy that it, that you couldn't eat it because it was too toxic, right. to to the point that you'd have. And so what 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 really 
getting back to your question, what triggered me was how education was the tool to reverse history. And it was the tool to go from, from chronic destruction of your natural environment and, and, and have a place that's not even healthy enough for your kids to go in. And then to have that be switched because of education. Eric, you had some thoughts. Well, you know, I just, I guess I just wanted to uh, acknowledge that, um, you, you know, I'm sure a lot of folks saw it in the paper maybe a month or so ago, but uh, the, our own State of Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources announced that, you know, we've centered our own oyster project in a historically very rich oyster bed that is Pearl Harbor. Uh, and so, you know, I think part of what brings it home for me and during homecoming, we were celebrating the successful, you know, homecoming of Hokulea, but I think we were also celebrating uh, the fact that there's a lot of incredible work that's been going on in, in Hawaii as well. And I just kind of wanted to um, bring light to that and share that, you know, that, that kind of reach is broad and global, but it's also intensely local. You know, no doubt this is part of the discussion is for the, for the next generation coming up, uh, the best ways to reach them and to, to expose them to all of the opportunities that, 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 that this brings. It's not, it's about the art of, of wayfinding, learning that practice. It's so important to, to the culture here. But I think sometimes maybe that idea gets a little boxed in for people who are still learning about what the hokulea can do. So what would you want to express um, to help continue to build this program and to help continue to get the younger generations interested, involved, and engaged, and understand um, just how widespread the value is of what the Hokulea does, what it represents, and the programs that are connected to it. What, what do you think is most important for the younger generation to understand? Mm. I, I just think that you, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's about creating opportunities, right? Voyaging and Hokulea can create it can create one opportunity that, that takes you in a pathway towards reconnecting to culture and traditions and your heritage and, and uncovering a history that's, that's, uh, that's just unbelievable. The greatest navigators, the greatest explorers on the face of the earth in their time um, discovered the largest nation in the world, 600 times more water than land. And, and even today, after 42 years of sailing, we still, still don't know how they did that. So <clears throat> the what Hokulea helps, and I think is one of the, the key pieces of its important to education, is the power of exploration. Now, there's many ways to explore, so the so that I'm going to hand it over to David um, because we have spent a lot of time together personally, trying to figure out the the relationship of um, exploration and creating creating access and pathways to our children to come into something that. And, and I will say, for Hawaiian children, they don't, don't have the access that, that for, for as many generations they think back, nobody graduated from college. Lucky you graduated from high school. They fear education. And so creating that, that not just a place that's safe for them to learn, but a place where they're dignified in the learning about voyaging. And so, so we have been looking at this pathway from the school systems and essentially getting children into the power of exploration through opportunities and graduating them. And, I, and I'll just say that um, right now, to me, the most important thing in the world is leadership. It's leadership. Uh, if you look at what's happening to the planet and, and the conversations of war, it, it's all wrong. It's all wrong. And, and so that we're right at the edge of whether, whether or not our children can even live in a peaceful world. And yet, that's why you need to catch, create these opportunities where young people, and you know, it's really from now, from zero, it's really P20 right now. Because if we're even to look at it uh, 20 years out, <clears throat> from now, who's going to be the leadership? It's investing in those 20 year olds and younger now. And so I'm really um, very privileged and very um, honored to have time with him. And, and be able to create these pathways so we get children to believe and, and get them to trust and then to, to come in and it's all about hard work. It's about creating a sale plan for your life. It's about, it's about, it's about creating all the things that you need to accomplish to be Translatable successful. Translatable lessons. Yeah, and then, and then get them through the system. So our relationship between 
Hokulea and the university is stronger now than ever, and I, I, I'm just hand it to David. You know, I'll just give two quick examples. Um, one is this, this Billion Oyster project. Um, when I visited um, um, the New York Harbor School with um, Hokulea and Nainoa when we were in New York, and Nainoa asked the simple question, wouldn't it be cool if we could make the Alawai awesome? And it, here we have the most polluted waterway, you know, it's the, the watershed uh, that comes down with the most people, flood threatened as we know well at the university, heart of our economy. And, and I just thought, well, what if we ask kids for solutions? And so we launched this year long um, project. It wasn't about voyaging, it was about Malamahonua. And inspired by the oysters, we had kids um, in schools throughout Hawaii and around the country trying to figure out how could you um, make the alawai awesome again. We, we put it very simply. And we awarded um, the prizes during the um, uh, homecoming. And the stuff that the kids came up with, the youngest kids, um, and pulling together um, tradition, restoration, and economics. Um, my favorite was the small kids who said, when we pull the poisonous metals out of the alawai, we can sell it. <laughs> Sometimes uh, it's that open it's, mind. Exactly, it's exactly. They it's got so that they had to pull this together. But <laughs> we're doing a lot of work now um, to try and use voyaging itself um, to inspire kids. Well, let's give another example, speaking of education okay. and talking about kids. Uh, the next video clip we have, this is out of Australia. Um, and uh, this is uh, the Reef Guardian Schools program, is that right? Uh, 310 schools um, were involved in this uh, at the Great Barrier Reef. Tell me a little bit more about what was going on here. That's so great that you got so many kids involved. This may be Miki. Sure. <laughs> I'm gonna keep throwing these videos yeah. to you. No, it's good. So, um, so our crew members were um, were able to meet with one of the Reef Guardian schools. There are, as you said, over 300 schools in the network, and these schools have at their core um, the mission to protect, preserve, and revitalize the Great Barrier Reef. And so, they um, they accomplish that in a number of different ways. Some of them having um, tanks and um, and places to study the species that live in the reef. Some of them going to market, um, preventing people from stealing Nemo and um, and other and Fortunes, dories from Fortunes. the reef um, by actually growing them in their own um, hatcheries and selling them to the pet stores and telling people not to take them from the reef and impact the reef habitat. Um, these schools also extend onto land and um, and create. Um, bird habitats and, um, and aquaculture and aquaponic systems for subsistence so that we learn in all ways how to um, utilize the resources in our natural environment in the least impactful way um, on the world around us. And so these kids are just amazing and have great and bright ideas that they um, bring people in and educate them about and they work in partnership with the, um, the Great Barrier Reef um, organization. You know, I'll tell you, so much of this is about exposure. Hmm. Sometimes uh, people, if they, if they don't have exposure, they don't know how many opportunities are out there. They don't know how they can grow uh, and what this can do for them and for their lives and for their community. Here's a quick question from one of our uh, viewers. Hokulea's impact has been uh, strong and far-reaching in schools with students. How can its mission and vision expand uh, to the community and businesses? How would you, how would you see that translated? Well, <clears throat> I think businesses has been evolving for the last 42 years. I mean, if you, um, for instance, I just got back from Maui. You know, it's going to be our first stop in Honolulu Bay. We went up to uh, a stream that was, uh, I don't know, decades ago. Well, the stream water was cut off for business purposes, for development. and. Um, and I went up there, and to make a long story short, I was just uh, in participation with about 100 community people where they fought to restore the water to replant taro. And, the, and then I watched these, uh, these, uh, the elders of, of, of that Ahupua, uh older women, two of them that were up there, and um, very quiet, to put the first taro plant back into the Loi in 135 years. And, and, when, and, and there were a lot of young people there that were part of the exposure. 
I mean, they, and, and, and they're impacted. But, that, but the, the issue was about the water, that if there's an old territorial law, that if your kuleana is next to a stream and you're planting traditional food, you have rights to the water. So they got that back. And, and, and then you had fishermen up there in the, in the forest saying, you should see the coral reefs, they're coming back. You see the balls of Nainui, they're coming back. And so, so it's one for the um, community to just be talking to themselves. But behind all of this, there's every hotel in that whole district is supporting. The, the zip line guys are, are closing their businesses to get trucks over there to make sure that we're gonna, when, we take, when we get there, we're, Kamehameha schools close their school for a day. 1,200 students are coming with the whole faculty to celebrate, and the, and the elementary school kids will be planting seeds in the vials that will become the seedlings for the core trees that will go replant from old um, pineapple lands and Marvin land and pine. And then so a thousand core seeds will be, will be planted by the, by the community and students. And the businesses are 100% right behind it. So that, so that the, what I'm seeing, at least in Maui, many other places, businesses are not, it's not like they're giving you handouts, like here's some money, go do what you want to do. They are part of the movement and it's happening. And if you, if you, if you took a look at where was business in reflection to what happened that day, why it was so important, when the elders were asked to be videotaped by someone that had a camera, I don't know who he was, they said no because the elders are so conditioned to not believe in their voice. That, that, that generation, my grandparents' generation, that uh, only talked about in, in living rooms, right, how my grandmother's uncle would take lye to rub the brown off his skin so he looked more white. And, uh, and, uh, and, and so that whole generation, I don't know how many there, all I know is that my stories from my grandparents that th you don't talk because nobody's going to listen. Business not going to listen. Government's not going to listen. Your courts aren't going to listen. And so that no matter how abusive the larger movement was in society, nobody's going to listen. And so yeah, I, I felt that when those ladies would refuse to go in front of the camera, but there were younger people that were stepping up. So, so in many ways, what's happening is that there's a change in voice. The, the, these, these streams matter, they count. The coral reef matters, it counts. Hawaiian culture matters. And so, so, so what you're happening is that, that I see, like, like in Maui and many other places, look at homecoming. I mean, everybody was supportive. It wasn't just the voyaging community that brought the canoe, it was everyone that brought the canoe in. So, so I, I think that, I think that it, we're in such an amazing time where, where the, large, the, the whole society is recognizing the need for change, back to renewal. And, uh, and that's, what, that's why Hawaii is so powerful right now. So it's not just, it's, it's, it, it's not just business, but it's also government. I mean, you, you look at the decisions that have been made in the last couple of years, it's all going towards taking care of this future for our children. Let's start moving a little bit into sort of what's coming up next, because I think um, not everybody's familiar with, with the next phase that's coming up for the Hokulea, already uh, well in the works. Um, and, and I think part of this goes to the transformation uh, for the, the entire um, presence of the Hokulea and what it represents. I mean, back in the day, in, in the 70s, when you first started, you were, you were learning the, 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 the practice, the art. You were um, understanding the, the oceans and, and, and what it could do. And now you've moved more and more into the roles of educator, uh, mentor, and bringing so many educators along with you into the program. This next phase um, that's coming up, a lot of this has to do with education. You really are getting into the schools. Tell me about this. You mean in the next year? In the next week, <coughs> right, 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 I right. believe. <laughs> <laughs> the Mahalo Hawaii yeah, right. Sail. I, I had a little introduction, introduction on that. Eight month voyage, 40 ports, 80 communities, much more work um, on land, working with schools. Right. So, so, so right. You're, you're, we're leaving in six days. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot going on. Yeah, there's a lot going on. But we have to. I mean, the again, the worldwide voyage is is designed to end in uh, at the end of uh, 2018. Well, in June of 2018, because of this of this responsibility to go back to the communities and thank them, but also at the same yeah, time. Yeah. So tell us about this phase. So it's we're coming gonna, up very soon now. Right, so we're going to go to these 40 ports, um, and, um, and um, 
we're, we're asking, one, for permission to come to the port and, and, and also to, to have permission to talk to communities. So, the, so yes, it's going to be, we've done statewide sales a number of times. This is probably the fifth one, fifth or sixth one over the last 40 years. But this one's different. This one is because, like Eric was saying, it's about moving the inspiration of the voyage on from the deck of Hokulea. Hokulea has carried a lot in the last three years. It's 48,000 miles. It's been a long voyage, hard voyage. And so taking that inspiration, transitioning it to really stories of action, things that are happening, the, the core plantings in Honolulu and so forth. So the, and it's also a bet, you know, so I went what around do you want, the world. When, you're, when you hit these ports and you hit these different schools, what do you want to happen? What do you want Education. to do? Education. We'll bring the canoe to educate their children in the communities, but also to sit down if they're willing to talk to the communities about where they want to go. When we start talking about what's the strategic plan for P Polynesian Boy inside in Hokulea, I don't, I, we no longer can sit in some room with a few people and, and throw some whiteboards up on the wall and say where we ought to go. You have to be able to take the voice of your community. This is the best way to do it because Hokulea allows us the access and our ability. So that eight months is going to be an awful lot of work in communities to find out to find out what is Hawaii doing, where do they want to go, and how do we help those now, who, do, do we know who's going to be on the crew yet? Has that been Well, they all will be. Uh, yet? Yeah. <laughs> At some point. As far as, it, <laughs> as, far as this, this next one coming up uh, next week, do, do you know yet uh, what that's well, going to be? Well, for sure. Or? Eric and Mickey are really going to be two of, of the key people that will be going into the community to really start to, have, to create conversations with communities. And then and David and I are just going to be witness to this so that we can make sure that our institutions are aimed in the, in the right direction. One of the viewers is asking about whether this is going to address um, water pollution here in Hawaii. Is that going to be part of either the curriculum or the discussion um, when you guys hit these different schools? Yeah, so I think um, as Nainoa and Eric and, and David have stated that um, part of our kuleana for this next leg of the voyage is really to listen to what are the concerns and also the efforts that are being made in each of the communities that we visit, um, looking for strategic um, collective impact kind of initiatives and, and pairings and, um, and opportunities that exist, whether it's around water quality, whether it's around economics, whether it's around cultural revitalization. It's just hearing the voice of the community as to the work that they've been inspired to do and the action that they've taken in the wake of not just the Malamo Honua worldwide voyage, but the 40 years of the, of the cultural renaissance that have we've been engaged in. And, and what does that mean for the next 40 years of Hawaii and our identity here? We have a couple of pictures, I think, from you, Eric, uh, water quality uh, pictures um, having to do with that. Let's take a look at those and, and tell me um, exactly what, what is happening in some of these pictures here. Well, sure. I th uh, this is specifically are some shots of the really incredible work that the Nature Conservancy, NOAA, uh, a whole host of partners, DLNR, uh, have been working on essentially to train up, uh, and Department of Health, to train up communities uh, to monitor uh, ocean water quality at the standards that are usable for kind of analysis and to inform management decisions at the state level. And, and that's really significant because it's no small thing to kind of understand all those kind of protocols and processes uh, how, on how to properly do that. Uh, and so to have motivated community who have volunteered to do that and hopefully grow that, continue to grow that across the state uh, would be, I think, really exciting because it frankly expands our collective capacity to do that crucial water quality monitoring work that you know, the state can't do it alone. None of us can do it alone. It's, you know, we're, we're a small island state. We're a huge ocean state. There's a lot to take care of. You know, somebody, one of the questions that somebody was asking is whether or not you guys are going to be in some of the rural areas on the big island, because this is all centered around Hawaii this time. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, you know I, would, I would defer to, you know, voyage leadership uh, in terms of the sail plan, uh, but my understanding is, is that, you know, those 40 ports are definitely going to include rural areas uh, oh, across the Hawaii. state. You know, here's another question I wanted to ask, too, because of um, who you learned from. Somebody was asking about the connections um, that you plan to make with the Micronesian community, maybe not quite mm. remembering that you're a teacher, mm. um, you know, Ma Pialug. Yeah, there's a lot of good projects going on. In fact, the Voyaging Canoe just arrived in, in the Marshall Islands uh, 
a few weeks ago that a project that we were partnering with, with, uh, with a, a organiza an amazing organization called Okeanos, where um, they're constructing uh, new voyaging canoes that are really modern design. So they, um, they are looking at uh, sustainable sea transportation in, in my community, primarily the poorest of all the islands. So we're working with the Marshalls, working with with This is all Palau. being discussed. No, they're being constructed. This is being this constructed. The third canoe is already built already. And wow. They're, and they're powered by that. the sun with solar panels, powered by the wind to drive the sails. And then um, they're also powered with uh, coconut oil. Really? So it's Yanmar diesel engines that didn't need any conversion and, and small coconut presses have been, been created to be given to the islands mm -hmm. so that they can make, one thing that the islands have, they have, um, they have a lot of coconut, so they can produce their own oil. Mm -hmm. So it takes them off the, uh, the uh, dependence on foreign oil, it takes them off the, I mean, the shipping situation in Micronesia is, yeah. it needs to be improved. So, so it helps with disaster relief, it helps with um, transportation, it helps with creating new economies, uh, especially in tourism. You know, we had uh, Mao's nephew on uh, not that mm -hmm. long ago, and he was talking about um, what oftentimes is a divide between the Hawaiian community, or has become right. a divide, and the Micronesian community, right. and how some of the programs that they've done just Board. dissolved those differences and those borders. Right. Once they right. realized that where uh, each of these two communities came from right. was from the same place and right. from the same spirit. And the real fortunate thing, we have really amazing um, Micronesian leadership on our crew also. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, a, a number of people that are working really, really hard to, 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 to tighten up that divide and, 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 to, and to get rid of it. And uh, it, it, let me say, it's, it's not easy, uh, but the common ground is the ocean, the common ground is voyaging, the common ground is the canoe, and the common ground is navigation. So um, we're working on it, but it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge, um, but I do, I, you know, I have the highest respect for those who are are coming to look at how, how can voyaging help uh, bring the, uh, our children together. You know, that goes back to a question from one of our viewers, um, Lloyd from um, uh, Oina. He said, uh, what were the possible risks that could have caused the voyage to fail? Uh, I'm sure there were, <laughs> where do we, uh, do we have another hour? <laughs> Maybe just a few examples that, um, you know, you really had to, had to plan for and, and, and maybe You know, the biggest risk would have been not to go. Um, and I say that, you know, that seed of the idea to go take care of the earth, Malama Hono, was planted in 1992. And uh, my good friend Lacey, uh, Kuaina, Keki Okaina, the astronaut, dies in 95. So we lose him and, um, and mentor, you know, and inspiration to me. But, but our leadership would debate, you know, we get together like once a year, <clears throat> a couple of times a year statewide, and we talk about it. And, and of course, the idea about going around the world is like so powerful of an idea <clears throat> to do, but for 16 years we we wouldn't go. We would would begin the the conversation. Wow, that is such an amazing thing. How how how, how important it would be for Hawaiian culture and Hawaii to go around the world. But when we start to debate stuff like hurricanes or or piracy or the mosquito or the or the rogue wave or violence in unstable countries. Um, and, and there's, when we did the assessment, we have 16 risk issues that could kill you. Wow. And so um, we would, in those conversations, we would um, we'd end up in the same place. Powerful dream, powerful vision, unrealistic. It's too dangerous, don't go. But what happened since 1992, and Lacey was the one that was like premonition, he's a scientist. So he knew climate change, he knew global warming, he knew about the sustainability issue. He knew that this pathway humanity is on is not gonna work. His arithmetic, a seven-year-old with a computer, is gonna calculate, this is, this is, this is taking us to failure. But, but, so he, um, but then the language started to increase, acidification, hypoxia, dead zones, the overfishing issues, and so the issue that the sail plan we're on is not going to work became more and more important. So the Worldwide Voyage began on April 1st, 2008, when the voyaging community got together in one room in Honolulu and put the vote on the table, shall we go around the world? But that wasn't the question. The question is, uh, what's more dangerous? 
is, is the is the hurricane or the piracy more dangerous, or is it tying to the dock and more dangerous? If, if and you tie to the dock and know that he didn't go and do nothing, then does then you, do you get identified and defined by ignorance and apathy and inaction when you could have gone? And we voted four times, and it had to be unanimous because there was no way we we're going to go around the world divided. We had to be unified, and that well, was an amazing day. <clears throat> Let me ask the, the the two of you because the two of you were on um, some of the deep sea legs and, and got a real taste for what it can be like out there. I, I wanted to maybe ask both of you or either one of you, after experiencing what you experienced, would you say the physical aspect of what you did more, was more difficult or more of a challenge or the mental aspect? Boy, that's kind of apples and oranges. I gotta say, I think they're equally difficult uh, in some ways. And, and I just want to premise it by saying I'm not voyaging leadership. I'm not a captain. I'm not a navigator. I'm a cook on board. Uh, so you know, I really defer to the folks who you know have done some really tough legs. You know, we 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 had we have all had challenges on our various legs, but um, I know some were extremely challenging, uh, sailing wise, voyaging wise. Uh, but you know that it's you know it's hard. Uh, you know, six hour shifts, six on, six off, you know, sleeping on a mat, you know, um, trying to get enough rest so that you're functioning properly, so that, you know, you don't, you know, let, you know, your fellow crew members down, you're doing what you've been asked to do, that, that can get pretty challenging. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I tend to, uh, I tend to lose a lot of weight <laughs> on the canoe, which is great. Uh, <laughs> but just because, you know, I'm not, I'm not eating quite as much as I normally would. and. Um, you know, it's a clean environment in that way too. Um, you know, I think, uh, so yeah, it, you know, that, that's a challenge. I mean, mentally too though, I mean, you're constantly, I think all of us have a responsibility when we're asked to sail to really think about what this means and what we're gonna do about it. And that's really challenging. I think that might be more challenging than mm. the physical. I would gather that there are plans for more training for navigators and crew members that we go along to keep this going. Uh, Mickey, uh, for you too, what might you want to share as far as what it's, what it's actually like? It's, it's, a, it's different to, to talk about it and, and see it on TV and uh, be there on land as opposed to actually being out there after yeah, days I think, go by. I think from an sort of opposite but related point of view, um, the, the voyaging um, portion and the deep sea crossing was was interesting and life changing and transformative. Um, but one of the things that I've been able to witness over the past three and a half years of the international legs is um, I'm one of the few people that gets to be in contact with both canoes or all of our canoes every day. And I keep a schedule of when you have to call a classroom or when you have to be on an interview or when you have to write your blog or when this is you. <laughs> so I'm the nagger. Um, and and in, that, in, in that nagging capacity, I get to see each of the crew members rise to this amazing place where they're sharing these stories from the heart and they're sharing about their experiences. And I get to watch each of them grow, just like my students, the hundreds <laughs> of students that I taught over the years. I get to watch each of the crew members sort of blossom and write from the heart and get into the groove of sailing and see how it transforms them. And I've felt very privileged to do that and to be able to convey that to the world through their writing and through their videos and through the pictures. So David, talking about educating and bringing more students in, this is a question from somebody. Will UH offer navigation wayfaring courses? <laughs> to help keep this alive? Is that something that would be Absolutely. considered? Absolutely. There's one tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we have a couple things going on. One is um, we're offering at the Marine Education Training Center, which is the Fantastic. UH facility that hosts the uh, Hokulea, Hikianalea. Um, we have crew training now, doing it as a non-credit. Um, but I'm, I've really been interested as I got involved in gathering together the people from across our 10 campuses, and, and we have really inspiring faculty, staff, and students who have been um, yeah. deeply involved as crew members, as navigators, as captains, um, and pulling them together to look at how to create um, curriculum around this. And um, part of it is about perpetuating the knowledge, and um, one of the things about great universities, we don't just perpetuate, we continue to grow it and extend it um, beyond just what was known 400 years ago, well, what more do we know now? But also, um, 
and, and you know, when you were asking about the Micronesian population, but also, um, as Nainoa mentioned, we have so many people in this state of, of all backgrounds um, who will struggle to survive. And continuing their education is the best thing that they can do to advance their health, their families, their communities, mm -hmm. their sustainability. And if we can inspire them with opportunities around voyaging, around sustainability, around Malama Honua, we can keep them moving ahead in school in ways that don't happen if they just sit in a classroom and listen to someone lecture. So we have one more piece of video we want to show, and we want to leave this uh, l last question to you, Nainoa, as we show you this video. This is from World Ocean Day, and you are presenting to uh, UN members, we can see the video here, um, with some ocean protection declarations and messages oh. of hope um, that they're giving. This must have been a very special day for you. I, I want you to reflect on this a little bit, but also moving beyond uh, Mahalo Sale. Where do you see this going, and how, how important would you say is this defining Hawaii in a particular way, creating some type of a legacy or something. What's that? You got to <laughs> the last few minutes to you. Last few minutes to you. Well, I mean, um, okay. Well, actually, we got a couple minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Abbreviated version. Blue planet, water, water defines life. It's uh, without water, you can't have life. And, um, and, and our whole life system is defined by the oceans. The greatest environmental issue before this time is really, if you want to protect life, is no, you've got to protect the oceans. So that was part of the campaign. And so we went to different countries and asked them, you know, you know, where are you going? Do you, do you have a declaration? Whatever it may be, and, and, and give it to us, and we'll carry it around the canoe. And so the Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, was in sail with us in Apia in 2014, but he brought a glass bottle with a handwritten note saying that he is going to pledge his duty to the countries he represents to make sure that oceans is at the top of the agenda. And so, he, and so, and then he asked, and then he wrote into our law book and asked, can Hokulea help collect those kinds of uh, commitments around the world? So we said, okay, we would. And so we went, and we don't have time to talk about it, but everybody we went to is not, it's, it's a different worldview of what our relationship is to the ocean. So we got all these commitments. And we took the bottle back to the United Nations, and, uh, and then we met over there on, on that, that little video, and we gave it all back. And so uh, where it's driving us now that um, one of the important things right now is that 15% of the terrestrial land on the Earth is, is governed by indigenous people, and 80% of pristine or healthy uh, forests are in that 15%. Uh, there are 15 Pacific Island nations that occupy 10% of the world's ocean surface. Small islands, big oceans. The, the main conversation right now is to create voice. It's to create voice in the Pacific people, indigenous people, that the reason, there, there's a direct relationship between why so much of it's healthy in their lands, because it's a kinship. Do you think what you're doing and the programs you're creating could define Hawaii? Hawaii defines itself. I, I went around the world and real quickly, uh, and I went to many places and uh, extraordinary places. Billion oysters, reef guardian schools. There is no place like Hawaii. Mm -hmm. that, that when you look at the, when you look at how we are moving in a collective way in terms of respect of culture, respect of environment, res respect of heritage, and you add it all up and, and all those things that define our values, Hawaii is moving towards renewal better than any place on the earth, and that is why that is why the things like the statewide sale coming together needs to be a new identity of how Hawaii looks at itself and defines itself. We don't need the rest of the world to define us. We do need to do that first, but the rest of the world is going to look here. They're going to look here because Hawaii is the light in, on the earth, it, and that's my bet in the worldwide voyage. I mean, the statewide sale, we're going to prove that. I, I'm, I'm not trying to be arrogant, I'm, I'm, but I, I'm humble, but we're going to go out and just collect the stories of, of great people on the earth. <clears throat> and, and, then it, and I think that identity shifts everything. It shifts what we teach our kids, and what we teach our kids will shift the future. And so the, uh, I love my home, and I know why. And so we're, this journey around the Hawaiian Islands is, is an absolute privilege. And, uh, and I just, uh, and then, so we need to go back to the Pacific, though, because the Pacific needs to collect that voice. And so we are. We're planning this out in 19 and 20. 
We know we could talk about this for hours, right. but I appreciate all of your voices today. Uh, thank you so much for just giving us a little bit of insight you. into your world and what's coming up next because so many more exciting programs to come. So mahalo to thank all of you, you for joining thank us tonight. We have you. a special film, by the way, coming up next, The Navigators, Pathfinders of the Pacific, uh, a 1983 <laughs> film directed by Sam Lowe and Boyd Estes. This documentary explores the heritage of Polynesian wayfinding and how indigenous Pacific societies sustained their navigational practices and practitioners. The film features the man who played an important role in Nainoa's life, mm. Mao Pialu, who in 1983 was the last known navigator to be ceremonially initiated in Sarawal, an atoll on Micronesia's remote Caroline Islands. But before we go again, thank you very much. Thank you. To Nainoa Thompson, Master Navigator and President of the Polynesian Voyaging Society, Eric Koh, Senior Program Officer for Marine Conservation for the Harold K. L. Castle Foundation, David Lasner, Chancellor of the University of Hawaii at Manoa and President of the University of Hawaii, and Miki Tomita director of the Polynesian Voyaging Society's Learning Center. I'm Laurie Amata for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho.